Hello. Hello. Today's presentation looks in part at the duality of human nature, especially those parts which are capable of hubris, arrogance, mean-spiritedness and cruelty. Especially those parts which are capable of creating love, generosity of spirit or great art and beauty. And there are few artists in the classic canon who represent both sides of this duarchy of human nature than today's subject. So, without further ado, Falklands, why do I exist? You exist solely for the purpose of playing second banana in the introduction to this video. Oh, that's a bit bleak. It is what it is. As soon as I turn off that green screen, you're gone. Oh, wasted my life. Look, if it helps, I'll let you do the throw to the video for today. Oh, that's a quantum of solace, I guess. This is The Righteous Bo Jambo, and it's time to talk about Van Morrison. In conversation on the topic of Van Morrison, the mention of astral weeks tends to invoke rapture, hyperbole, and the personal reflection of how it changed the conversant's life and rocked their gypsy souls, etc. and whatnot. Of course, Van's milestone millstone didn't start out as his universally acclaimed masterpiece. Back in 68, listeners weren't ready for his meditative and loose folk jazz fusion after the rollicking rock of them's Gloria and the soon-to-be inescapable brown-eyed girl. Yet, fixed as Astral Weeks has become in the constellation of essential marks when name-dropping the greatest albums of all time, six years after its release, when its spiritual cousin and, say it softly, successor, Veden Fleece, came by, the critics had not apparently become any kinder or wiser. The then arbiter of hipness, noted toilet paper substitute Rolling Stone, led the way when Jim Miller called the record abortive, an aberration, and most directly, pompous tripe. This time, however, there were defenders. Leonard Cohen, for example, loved Feed and Fleece, calling it superb in Melody Maker. And since then, its cult has grown. The late Jeff Buckley had it in his personal record collection alongside about a dozen others by Morrison. And the influence of Veden Fleece is very apparent in Buckley's work. Elvis Costello counts the album as essential. Sinead O'Connor not only swears by it, but she, like me, considers it to be superior to Astral Weeks. However, Comparing Veden Fleece to Astral Weeks at even the most superficial level requires more compelled regurgitation and citing of rote learning than any doctor or teacher would advise. Astral Weeks is such a well-travelled road and so aggressively defended by its supporters that any comparison directly between the two immediately assumes Veden Fleece to be the inferior and occludes listening to it as its own piece even as the outlier it was initially assessed to be, as the aberrant catalogue entry, the original execution and Jim Miller concluded it was. Although both records are rooted in the stream of consciousness lyrics and the jazzy inflections of the instrumentation, there's a richness of maturity, experience and objective that colours the stories of Veden Fleece, that delineates it clearly from Astral Weeks. Veen Fleece is, at its simplest and most unfair quantum, a breakup album of the ilk of Sinatra's Where Are You but without the consuming self-pity, or Dylan's Blood on the Tracks but without the defensive self-mythology. Still, to categorise Veed and Fleece as such for mere convenience oversimplifies and diminishes a record brimming with thematic complications. 
obviously informed by his recent divorce and his relationship with his new flame, Carol Guida, the record exudes a sense of literary adventure, at times evoking epic quests alongside existential ones, internal narratives alongside those of time and place. Thus, Veden Fleece is the sound of new beginnings. At a loose end after separation and divorce from his first wife, Janet Rigsby, despite rock legend, she was never named Janet Planet, that was a disparaging nickname Morrison gave her, which she detested, uh, especially when he put it on an album cover. In 1973, Morrison retrenched to Ireland, not however his native and war-torn Northern Ireland, but the southern part, ostensibly to make a TV special, but also to canoodle with his aforementioned new flame. Morrison's stay was a brisk jaunt, lasting just three weeks, yet that relatively brief period proved immensely productive, inspiring the writing of most of the songs that would eventually appear on the record. Musically, the album is a turnaround in style from Hard Knows the Highway's crazed eclecticism. Morrison made the album on two coasts, in California with a few of the Hard Nose the Highways sizable ensembles players and in New York with professional session musicians, recorded later out east where the record company mandated Hard Nose the Highway offcast bulbs and cul-de-sac be recorded for a single, relying on seasoned jazz pros to fill out the small scale combo. Rigsby's absence takes centre stage more or less immediately on Veden Fleece, where in the opening Fair Play saunters in with light strums and piano keys. Fifteen seconds in, Morrison bursts out, Fair play to you, Kalani's lakes are so blue. Capturing his sense of place and spirit and liberation in more ways than one, and thence pouring forth a torrent of literary interests, free associating some uniquely intimate biography while hailing Oscar Wilde. Uniquely intimate in the repeated, there's only one meadow way to go and you say Geronimo line. Not so much a stream of consciousness psychobabble, but a reference to the former family home, which after a little bit of independent research, turned out to be on Meadow Way in San Geronimo, California. There's also Hi-Ho Silver, tit for tat, I love you for that. A wry reference for the night Janet took the only rock star accouterer at Van Own, his silver Mercedes, packed her goodies and Morrison's beloved daughter Shana in it and left him, not to speak to him again until 1994. Less a cast aside of an old love, it's a spirited but balanced contemplation, a taking of account and a taste of a bewitching liberty, not so much a Dylan-esque exercise in masking through parables, or Lou Reed's plain-spoken but harrowing emotional breakdown as on Berlin, but a man coming to terms with his emotional shortcomings and growing through it. After the freewheeling fair play, the bad man fantasy of Lyndon Arden stole the highlights, feels more grounded if we see Arden as, in fact, Morrison, a physically dislocated man, given to the contradictions of spirituality, drinking and a vile temper, which certainly matches Rigsby's sketch of him at the time. Its violence comes almost lazily, Morrison's delivery poetic yet casual when it comes to depicting what amounts to a literal hatchet job. The vocal is muscular, hinting at a yet to be deployed power over a stately piano and elastic bass. The song's closing line, now he's living with a gun, is the central motif of the next track, the regretful falsetto of Who Was That Masked Man, which paints an unflattering portrait of who Morrison was at the final reckoning of his marriage. While it stands as no surprise that Celtic accents and influences abound after re-emerging on 1972's St Dominic's Preview, the depth and authenticity of those found on Streets of Arklow really should be expected on this album, written largely in Ireland. Still, given the duality of the R&B influence and the Irish folk song tradition that come to typify Morrison to the point of branding him, the former feels like a natural extension of the two, part greasy work song of the shedding of old dirty skin and the growing of a new coat reconciled in his influences and the contrast between the gritty strings 
street walking and the gliding strings of ritual purifications in nature and literature seems all too literal for us not to note. The twisting transformational centerpiece of the album, you don't pull no punches but you don't push the river, sprawls and rambles back and forth in time and place. Dense and at points incomprehensible, the song details Morrison's quest for his King Charles's head, his snark, his nothing, the mythic vegan fleece. Neither he nor any of the cast of luminary angels he summons to help him can find it, left as they are, staring behind the sun on the west coast of Ireland, tellingly towards America. This nearly nine minute Homeric tale is couched in an arrangement that surges and twists and carries seemingly its own narrative. Quaking with manic beauty, the song refocuses all of the mad visionary energy of Morrison and is a key point in both his life and his career in the formulation of that which is the coming greatness of his Common One album. For all the William Blake driven psychobabble before it, the final phase of the album led by the plain spoken comfort you operates with its intent laid bare. Divorce breaks people both in big ways and subtle and at its best outcome it can refocus someone as to their priorities required in order to carry on. Cry for me so that I can cry to you. That's a survival transaction. Musically Comfort You comes across as straightforwardly as its lyrical linear folk ballad arrangement which benefits from Morrison not overdoing it with the vocal paraphernalia and allowing the music to speak for itself. Recorded as they were at the record company man's insistence, the East Coast pair Bulbs and Cul-de-Sac definitely glimmer with rock polish. While Bulbs is an enjoyable rocking romp in part ameliorating the burdens of who was that masked man, with Morrison cheekily reminding us that it's all showbiz, Cul-de-Sac, while equally buffed and polished, is a gorgeous song that fits perfectly with the record as a whole. As opposed to Bulb's urge to go, to fly, to find new frontiers, to cross and stand on Atlantic sand, Cul-de-Sac urges the listener to go back to those moments, should they have them, where they can find them, where they can feel the warmth and safety of a true home. The album ends with a neat sense of closure and completion. The brief Come Here My Love sees Morrison's slightly woozy croon communicating some state of rapture and ecstasy and desire to build forth from that, while the lengthier country fair is a final meditation on nature, on love's place amongst it, of the difference between spiritual and physical home, and a message to us that even though the Veden fleece can't be had, this can. It's a generous way to sign off. Peaking at number 53 on the Billboard charts and gone after 10 weeks, Veden Fleece has virtually disappeared to but a small cult of followers in the intervening near 50 years. Over four major official Van Morrison compilations, only Fair Play makes an appearance on the latest Essential. He did include four of the songs in his volume of hand-chosen selected lyrics, Bulbs, Come Here My Love, Comfort You and Cul-de-Sac. All songs from the back half of the record and it's very unlikely even that fans interested enough to buy such a book would have readily known those songs. Cult records are all too often a crooked roulette wheel. Jimmy DeFavor the cultist. The cultist range from people like me and Sinead who see this as an artist exercising a perverse prerogative and triumphing to mere contrarians who can champion the willfully obscure or underappreciated to downright ridiculous extremes. The difference between the former and the latter classes of fans is the former hope that the record outgrows being a cult record, and the latter define their hipster existence by refuting the popular and often worthy for their own self-assessed set of values. View it through whichever prism you like, but Veden Fleece is not an album you can simply wave about and claim some innate esoteric knowledge of. It requires work. It requires understanding of context, and it requires acceptance that the hero quest is never completed. 
Van the man never does find the damned Veden fleece, but he finds the next best thing. Who knows? Maybe if you join the cult, you'll find it. There's only one way to be sure. I've been thinking. About what? Well, what if I'm the real Foul Prince and you're just the construct of an ontological singularity? What now? Well, if we exist within polycategorical singularities rather than the flat ontological singularity that you're proposing, you may well be the one who disappears when you turn off the green screen. Well, there's only one way to find out. Now look what you've done.